SCP-5002 A Death in Containment A woman is found dead under strange circumstances, and a detective is brought in to solve the case and identify the potential murderer. Everyone is a suspect, nothing is as it seems, and the detective will find themselves embroiled in an unsettling mystery. This sounds like text that could be found on the back of any dime store detective novel, but a murder mystery in the SCP universe brings in certain oddities to the typical narrative. Through twists and turns, lies and backstabbing, we'll get to the bottom of this mystery and find out exactly who or what caused a death in containment. Like all good murder mysteries, we start with the victim, an SCP held by the Foundation. This particular SCP is human though, or humanoid at least a female reality bender named Emma Hastings. She was born in 1978 in England, and coincidentally worked as a novelist of detective fiction, publishing ten novels before being contained. Emma didn't seem to be a general reality bender capable of multitudes of abilities, but rather had one peculiar trait. When she reread her own published works, the events described in the text would occur in reality with some altered details, such as names, dates, and locations. The Foundation discovered the correlation between UK police reports and Emma's works, and she was taken into Foundation custody in February of 2017. Emma claimed to have no knowledge of her ability. On December 14th, 2019, at approximately 7am, Emma was found in her bed, deceased. The door to the containment cell was locked, and there was no sign of forced entry. More perplexing, records show that the door had not been unlocked in the preceding 12 hours, and security footage shows only Emma in the cell during that time. Additionally, Scranton reality anchors throughout the facility did not fail at any point. The game is afoot, and now enters our detective, Agent Ellen O'Connor of the Department of Analytics. Like any murder mystery, the cast of characters is very important, as it's very likely that one of them is the perpetrator of murder most foul. We of course have Agent O'Connor heading the investigation, but we also have the site director of Site 06, Evelyn May, senior researcher Dr. Karen Yao, junior researcher Michael Simpson, security officer Joseph Lowry, chief medical officer Dr. Nadine Grossenbacher, and a nameless D-Class, who happened to be present in the same wing as Emma when she died. O'Connor gathers these people together because all of them were in the same wing that night, save for one other person, and thus they are all suspects. She says that although Emma was an anomalous human being, she was nevertheless a human being, and she deserves justice. She starts by going back to the incident that brought Emma to the Foundation's attention in January of 2017. A newspaper article describes the London Metropolitan Police as baffled over having no leads in the murder of PhD student Kate Holloway. They have reached out to the public for any information about the girl's death. She was 23 years old and was found beaten to death in her office, the London School of Economics. The office was locked from the inside and no murder weapon was found. Sounds kind of familiar. A picture-perfect murder straight out of a novel that just needs a dashing detective to solve it. Only in real life, dashing detectives are short in supply. Back in the present, Agent O'Connor catalogs the list of items found in Emma's containment cell. The bed, covered in blood, a table and chair, a TV with remote, a typewriter with stationery and typewriter paper, a 432-page manuscript, 150 sheets of paper containing holes cut with scissors in abstract block patterns, a bottle of Jack Daniels whiskey, and a set of foundation basic women's clothing. Considering how badly a lot of humanoid SCPs are treated, not too bad of a setup, aside from the forced imprisonment and murder of course. O'Connor first interviews Joseph Lowry, a security officer at Wing G of Site 06. He typically works the night shift, and was the first to discover Emma's body at 7am. 
He was taking the D-Class from his cell to the kitchenette for breakfast, as although most D-Class in Site-06 are held in central accommodations, this one was being held in a spare containment chamber as he was involved in testing. O'Connor confirms that the D-Class's room allocation was determined by the site director. As Joseph was walking back before finishing his shift, he made sure to give all of the containment doors a quick check to make sure they were all locked. Upon arriving at Emma's door, he grew suspicious, as typically Emma would yell something at him as he walked past, but the cell was silent. O'Connor asks if it was possible she didn't hear him, but he says that he always gives her door an extra hard shake, nice and noisy. O'Connor surmises that Joseph didn't care for Emma, and he confirms it, telling her that no one here did, because Emma thought she was better than everyone else here. Joseph opened the viewing plate, saw her lying in bed with blood everywhere, and immediately went to Dr. Yao to get her keycard. Although it would normally be a security violation for Dr. Yao to hand off her keycard, this was an emergency, and Joseph says that they're a team that trusts each other here. When Joseph made it into Emma's cell, he found her not moving and checked her pulse. Dr. Yao came in at this point, saw Emma, and started screaming. O'Connor asks if he thought this scream was authentic, and Joseph assures her that it was, as Dr. Yao has a kind heart. He took her outside the cell, calmed her down, and then waited there while she went to call the site director and medical officer. The medical officer, Dr. Grossenbacher, is our next interviewee. Describing the scene when she arrived at 745, she notes that the D-Class was secured in the hallway for some reason, and describes him as an unpleasant man, much worse than the poor girl that previously occupied his testing position. Upon examination, Grossenbacher finds a large amount of dried blood on the blankets, particularly around Emma's torso, and hypothesizes that she died from severe trauma to the heart and lungs, caused by multiple stab wounds. She estimates that Emma was stabbed at least ten times, confirming O'Connor's suspicion that the perpetrator was right-handed and slightly taller than the victim. Grossenbacher guesses that the most likely murder weapon is a short, sharp-pointed blade, and when O'Connor asks if that would be something like the doctor's scalpel, Grossenbacher laughs and says a common kitchen knife would be just as likely. When asked if she observed anything unusual, Grossenbacher says that there were no obvious defensive wounds, so the assailant either knew Emma or surprised and overpowered her. She also notes that there were no conclusive results from a sexual assault evidence kit. During her examination, Dr. Yao had been reporting the incident to the site director, Director May, who apparently had a particular interest in Emma and had been pressuring Dr. Yao to produce testing results. Although O'Connor doesn't specifically find this unusual, as Foundation personnel are typically under pressure, Dr. Grossenbacher encourages her to ask Director May about it. She concludes by estimating that Emma died between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. last night, and says that she was in her room in the medical wing, sleeping. When she remarks with gladness that there are some places here with no cameras, such as her room, O'Connor asks her if she has something to hide. Grossenbacher says she has no secrets, but O'Connor isn't convinced, as everyone at the Foundation has secrets. Back to Joseph Lowry. He's asked about the security station in Wing G. Sitting at the station, he has a clear view of both hallways, one containing the cells, and the other leading towards the staff quarters and kitchenette. Clearly, Wing G is a pretty low-risk and small section of the facility. He has video screens for each containment chamber, and the system keeps a record of any keycard uses. His shift starts at 11.30pm and ends at 7.30am, and he stays at the station almost the entire time save for a smoke break at 2 a.m. The smoke break lasts about 10 to 15 minutes, and anyone that tries to enter the wing while he's outside will let off a buzzer, so Joseph would have heard it. He ponders that maybe somebody with level 5 clearance might be let in without the buzzer going off, but it's never come up. Joseph himself has keycard access to the main doors and the door to the D-class's cell, but only Dr. Yao has access to the SCP cells. 
Records show that none of the doors save the main door at 2 a.m. were accessed using key cards. Camera footage also showed nothing out of the ordinary, with Emma sleeping in her bed when Joseph arrived at 11.30, and the other SCPs quiet in their cells. Joseph himself is baffled as to how Emma could have been killed, but O'Connor assures him that's why she's here, to which Joseph asks if she's Sherlock Holmes. O'Connor says that Foundation investigations are much more difficult, as Sherlock Holmes could afford to eliminate the impossible. The interview comes to a close as another individual comes in and tells O'Connor that someone was trying to leave Wing G without her permission, and Joseph says that Dr. Yao might have made a copy of her keycard and given it to someone else. The person that she had given it to, and the person trying to leave right now, is junior researcher Mike Simpson. Mike is quickly locked up in a cell for his interview, and he vocally protests being kept there since he has an urgent appointment this morning. Mike was in his quarters the previous night, working late on his thesis. This morning, when Emma's body was discovered, he was in the kitchenette finishing breakfast. He had heard Joseph shaking her door quite loudly, then he heard running in the corridor, and heard Dr. Yao screaming. O'Connor asks him if he had used the knife that they found in the dishwasher in the kitchenette, but Mike emphatically denies it, saying that it was there when he arrived. The knife had gone through a full wash cycle, so they couldn't glean any fingerprints off of it. After he heard Dr. Yao scream, he went to the containment cell, and says that not even Emma deserved that, referring to her as it. O'Connor asks about this, saying that everyone else here refers to her by name or by a personal pronoun, but Mike says that they're not people, they are anomalies. Just because it moves and talks doesn't mean it should be treated any differently than any other anomaly. Mike has been involved with extensive testing with Emma over an extended period, and mentions that Dr. Yao doesn't really ever get stressed. Mike really likes Dr. Yao as a boss, as she lets him be properly involved, and lets him work independently, which also includes giving him a copy of her keycard. Mike says that he's almost never used it, as he has it just in case. Let's look at some of this testing that had been going on with Emma. The text excerpt we're given involves Dr. Yao, Mike, Joseph, and the female D-class that preceded the current one. Throughout the test, Mike continually refers to Emma as the entity, and is gently rebuked by Dr. Yao. Emma and the D-class are placed near a table with two buttons, one red and one green. Emma has written on a paper that the D-Class walks to the table and presses the buttons 12 times in a specific order. Emma reads the text out loud, the D-Class moves to the table, and presses the buttons in the described order. Emma is amazed to actually see her ability at work, and is asked to read the text again, to no effect. Mike continually snaps at her to be quiet whenever she speaks and tells her to read a new copy of the same text. This also has no effect, so Mike takes the text and redacts part of it so that it's no longer proper English, but is still coherent. After reading the text, the D-Class presses the buttons in the correct order, but her movements appear jerky and uncoordinated. Afterwards, the D-Class says that she didn't want to touch the buttons, but she did, and cries while asking what Emma did to her. As the testing concludes, and Mike takes Emma back to her cell, she ponders what would have happened if the D-Class had been restrained when she was reading. O'Connor talks to Dr. Yao about Emma, first speaking of her as an anomaly. It took them quite a while to figure out how her effect works, and since the effect only occurs from published works, they have to heavily screen everything Emma writes before publishing it. The manuscript found in her chamber was a novel she had written on their suggestion, about the daily life and psychology of a D-class subject. It was neither violent or dramatic, instead much slower and meditative. Emma never had any unauthorized work written, and nothing in her past work resembles her own murder. Dr. Yao describes Emma as cooperative, well-adjusted to containment, intelligent, and honest. O'Connor suspects that Dr. Yao had some affection for Emma, 
and asks if she authorized her to have the bottle of Jack Daniels in her cell. Dr. Yao denies this, saying that she isn't stupid, and she's sure that no one on their team gave it to her. The discussion shifts to Joseph and Mike, who didn't get along with Emma the same way. Dr. Yao says that Joseph acts tough and likes to wind up the anomalies now and then, but he wouldn't do anything like this. As for Mike, she says that when he first joined her team, he was more relaxed, but something changed after Emma arrived. O'Connor asks if it was stress, possibly from pressure by the site director to produce testing results. Dr. Yao never noticed anything like that, despite what Dr. Grossenbacher said, and suggests that perhaps Grossenbacher might have been thinking of another wing, as she moves between them often. She only stops in wing G if one of the anomalies gets injured, and it's been much less often since she got promoted to Chief Medical Officer, a recent and rapid promotion. Dr. Yao describes her as an excellent and responsive medical officer who genuinely cares about people, notably the female D-Class who suffered a breakdown. She doesn't have keycard access to Wing G though, unlike Dr. Yao and Joseph. O'Connor brings up the copied keycard she gave to Mike, but she says that he never uses it, and he's too careful to lose it. She then describes the events from her perspective of Joseph coming to get her and seeing Emma's body. Notably, she mentions that the D-Class who was standing nearby said, Looks like she got what was coming to her. O'Connor dismisses this as evidence, but Dr. Yao asks her if she knows how he ended up as a D-Class. Switching over to her interview with the D-Class, it turns out that he ended up here through seven murder convictions, one for aggravated assault and wounding, and three other suspected murders, all due to multiple stab wounds. The D-Class freely admits to this, and says that he would do it again, but claims that he didn't kill Emma, despite wanting her dead. He hated Emma because of what she did to him throughout the tests, which he describes as both physical and mental torture, not only against his will, but making him feel like he was choosing to do these things. Although it could seem that Emma herself was being forced to comply, the D-Class says that she was in on things with Dr. Yao, suggesting new tests just to further humiliate him. Not only did he hate her, but he was also terrified of her, especially after one incident in which he refused to leave his cell, fought with the guard, and vomited. He later found out that that was another test written down and read by Emma. He could no longer trust anything he did or thought because it could have been put there by her. He's glad she's dead, but he didn't kill her. He was in his cell last night, and was in the kitchenette for dinner, but claims he didn't take any knife from the kitchen. The interview concludes with him saying that he was in his cell, Emma was in hers, and neither of them have a key. So why doesn't O'Connor ask the guy who can walk through walls? The guy who can walk through walls is an anomalous humanoid formerly known as Robert Gates, born in the UK. His ability to pass through solid matter is limited to his body and clothing, and he's kept in a cell with a constantly active Scranton reality anchor. Robert displays evidence of antisocial personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder, and was implicated in the rapes and assaults of more than 30 women, each in their own homes with no evidence of entry. O'Connor's interview with Robert confirms that he is quite a horrible individual and he spends the interview trying to create doubt and fear in O'Connor's mind. He claims that he could walk out of his cell at any moment, despite the reality anchors in place, and mentions that he's read Emma's test logs because Dr. Yao left them lying around her room at night. He says that he did not kill Emma, as a frenzied stabbing really isn't his style, and he also says that he wasn't scared of her ability. As O'Connor finishes the interview, he tells her that he'll think of her the next time he walks through the site, and asks where she sleeps. We finally get to the interview with the site director for Site-06, Director May. May says that she's under a great deal of pressure, as more and more disasters keep piling up for her to deal with. 
O'Connor asks if she can see the reality anchor records for Wing G to check if there's been any problems recently. May admits that there have been some issues with the anchors, some malfunctions and even some failures, and she's been editing security reports to keep that info from spreading. She didn't think there had been any problems because of it, but now she asks if O'Connor thinks that Robert Gates had something to do with Emma's murder. It's plausible that Robert could have gotten into Emma's cell and murdered her, but he couldn't have brought a knife with him due to the limitations of his ability. May assures her that there had been no problems with the reality anchor in Emma's cell. O'Connor also asks for the latest psychiatric evaluations from Wing G, mainly because of the stress that Mike has been under. May denies the idea that she had been putting any excessive amount of pressure on the team, despite the connection she had with Emma, since she had been part of the team that had identified her as the source of anomalous effects. She also confirms that even a level 5 keycard would show up on the records if she had entered the wing at night. The rest of the interview concerns May's whereabouts that night, as she reveals she had been at a meeting with her divorce lawyer and didn't get back to the site until 3 a.m. She mentions that she didn't get a call from Dr. Yao until around 7.30 a.m., surprising O'Connor, who thought that Dr. Yao called the director immediately after finding the body. The latest psychiatric evaluations for Wing G showed that most of the individuals, personnel, and anomalies passed, but the male D-class and Mike are listed as on watch. The female D-class and one of the anomalies, presumably Robert, failed, and Joseph is listed as past, but to see Dr. Yao's comments. Next, we get an interview from a week prior between Dr. Yao and Emma. They are discussing the novel that Emma is working on, which Emma is satisfied with so far, although practically no one will read it. She says that she started writing because she needed to, but she also savors the reaction of a captivated reader. Dr. Yao asks her if she understood the effects of what she was writing, deliberately creating events for herself, something she apparently asks Emma a lot. They enter a discussion about the nature of authors and readers when it comes to characters in a story, on whether the author is controlling the characters or do the readers bring them to life. This would be a normal literary discussion if not for the fact that Emma can actually create events with her writing and Dr. Yao has trouble getting her to admit on whether she knew the effects of her work. They continue on to discuss the genre that Emma usually works in, crime and investigation. She says that with detective fiction, the simplest solution is usually the best, killing for money, love, or revenge, and anything else creates more questions than it answers. Emma understands why she's being kept here in the Foundation, and while she would prefer freedom, she doesn't seem unhappy. That brings us back to where we started, with Agent O'Connor in the common room of Wing G, with all of the potential suspects gathered around. It's of course time for the detective's big reveal, where they explain everything they've learned and solve the case with some brilliant deductions. I would tell you to take all the facts that you've learned so far, and make your own educated guess about the perpetrator, but Truth be told, you don't have all of the facts yet, so let's just sit back and let it unfold. Agent O'Connor says that she is sitting in a room full of liars, starting with Joseph lying about the length of his smoke break, and failing to mention that he had been drinking. Normally he would smuggle out his bottle of Jack Daniels at the end of his shift, but when he found Emma's body, he knew they would search the wing so he panicked and hid the bottle in the containment cell. She says that the only person who didn't lie to her here is the D-Class, who said that he didn't kill Emma. Director May asks if she thinks Robert was the murderer, which leads O'Connor to claim that May had been the subject of blackmail over knowledge about the reality anchors failing across the site. The person doing the blackmailing would have moved across the site repeatedly, seen evidence of the failing anchors, and who had evidence that Robert was regularly breaking containment. This person is, of course, Dr. Grossenbacher, who had the foresight to bring a sexual assault kit to a murder scene, 
specifically because she suspected Robert was involved. She also traced the female D-Class's breakdown to repeated attacks by Robert, and since May was responsible for covering up the reality anchor's failures, she blackmailed May into a sudden promotion to chief medical officer. O'Connor says that May was lucky, however, as Grossenbacher didn't know what she was really up to. The reality anchors weren't malfunctioning, as random malfunctions would have eventually hit Emma's chamber as well, but they didn't, and Robert was able to regularly escape containment. She had placed Robert in Wing G, despite him not being a low-risk humanoid, specifically so that he would attack and terrorize Emma. She had shown an interest in Emma, but was rather relaxed about Dr. Yao's slow progress in testing. She just wanted to know that Emma was suffering. The reason for this was provided to O'Connor by May's divorce lawyer, who confirmed that May's maiden name was Holloway, mother of Kate Holloway, murdered in 2017 due to Emma's anomaly. At this point, Director May completely confirms these accusations and says that Emma could die a thousand times and it would never be enough. Mike responds by asking how can she say that about her, which O'Connor picks up on. Mike was the one who brought the knife into Emma's containment cell. The pressure that Mike had been experiencing was because he got introduced to Dr. Yao, who treated the humanoid anomalies like people, and he realized that they were. He kept up a stony exterior, but secretly, he had joined the Serpent's Hand, a group devoted to the rights of anomalies. The fact that he had even remembered seeing a knife in the dishwasher was notable, according to O'Connor, and his mysterious personal appointment immediately after the murder. That same day, a way had appeared next to the site, a portal commonly used by members of the Serpent's Hand to travel. This way was Mike's escape route, as he was supposed to break Emma out of containment, and the two would flee through the way. The signal for him to make a move was Joseph rattling Emma's door and then going on his smoke break. Mike took the knife from the kitchen, used his keycard to open her door, and then offered the knife to Emma. When he told her to escape, though, she refused, because she had fallen in love with Dr. Yao. After hearing this, Mike went back to his room, leaving the knife behind. Dr. Yao confirms that the two were in love, and she kept the research progress slow just to keep her near. She had managed to work out how to edit the surveillance system so that Emma would appear to be alone in her cell every night. O'Connor wouldn't have even looked at the footage that closely if she hadn't been trying to figure out where the Jack Daniels bottle came from. Dr. Yao was the one who erased Mike's keycard usage from the records, which is why it took her so long to call the director after finding the body. She had been in the cell when Joseph rattled the door, and likely passed Mike when he was on his way to the cell. O'Connor says that Emma wasn't killed in her sleep, but was likely stabbed standing up, then wrapped in the sheets and dragged back to bed. Mike also says that he had forgotten to lock the cell door when he left, and Joseph rattles the door every time he passes it. This means that Joseph checked the door when he came back from his smoke break and found it unlocked. He had been a little drunk and went into the cell, where Emma told him about her and Dr. Yao. Joseph used the knife and murdered Emma, because he himself was in love with Dr. Yao. Emma had mentioned to him about the cameras being edited, so he knew he wasn't filmed. He left the cell, put the knife in the dishwasher, and waited calmly until morning when he went over and pretended to discover her body. He had gone straight to Dr. Yao to get her keycard so that he could hide the fact that the door was actually unlocked still, gambling that Dr. Yao would wipe the door records. He also had rolled the corpse over to explain any blood on his clothing. His only real mistake, of course, was leaving the bottle of Jack Daniels behind. Case closed, Joseph is detained, life goes on. In Agent O'Connor's final report about the case, written months later, 
She reflects that while Joseph was responsible for killing Emma, she's not sure if he's guilty of murder. The only outstanding question about the case is the involvement of Emma, and whether or not her abilities led to her own death. While the reality anchors in her cell seem to have never failed, and there are no written materials from her that correspond to what happened, there is one thing. Way back towards the start, when I listed the items found in Emma's cell, there were 150 sheets of blank paper with holes cut in them in abstract patterns. O'Connor ponders if it's possible that these papers would function as a type of cipher, utilizing the novel she had been working on revealing a secondary work of text. It's possible that this could have activated Emma's ability, leading to not only her death, but what is effectively a suicide. If this is indeed the case, it raises more questions about what Emma had been up to, on whether she had made Dr. Yao love her, or made Director May hate her. Had she in fact written out this entire case as one last piece of detective fiction, all the people involved, little more than characters in a book. Agent O'Connor concludes that she refuses to believe that she had been used in this way, instead believing that she is real, and she hopes that the reader feels the same way about her and themselves. Murder, lies, clues, love, hate, revenge, anger, twists and turns everything a good detective story should have. And while many such stories might wrap up nicely with a perfect solution, it's not quite the case here. In a lot of ways, this is really more of a tale than an SCP, as we occasionally tackle around here, but it's a really enjoyable piece of SCP fiction nonetheless. Ultimately, I think your enjoyment of this article depends heavily on how you feel about crime and detective fiction, as it hits all of the right notes purposefully so. Of course, it was designed that way by the author, but whether or not it was designed that way by Emma is up to your imagination.